Hello, uh, I'm Jim Wigner, and uh, welcome to our continuing survey of the Old Testament. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at the book of Joshua. Joshua is the first of the historical books. Uh, there are 12 books that run from Joshua to Esther. And the book of Joshua is really the story of God fulfilling his promise that he had given to Abraham and to Israel that they would in inherit this land someday. And it's also the story of God's judgment for sin, and it's a story of God's redemption for those who turn to him. So uh, let's uh, start with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into things. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that we can learn from it. We thank you for this book of Joshua, where you reveal uh, a lot of your character to us. You reveal your faithfulness to us and to Israel. We thank you for your faithfulness to Israel and for your faithfulness to us and that we can trust you in every area of our lives. And I pray as we go through this book tonight that you will help me to teach with clarity and that you will help us to learn the things that you want us to learn that we can apply to our own lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, so let's start with a little history. <clears throat> Who wrote the book? When was the book written? It's obviously about Joshua and the children of Israel and their conquest of the promised land. Um, Joshua died <coughs> around 1375 BC. We know that he didn't finish the book because the book records his death. It's kind of hard to do that uh, after you're dead. Um, we also glean a couple of things from some verses uh, in Joshua 4.9. It says, Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the memorial stones as we, we go through. Uh, Joshua 6.25, But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive, and she has lived in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. That expression to this day that we see in both those verses means that the book was written after the events. It's looking back at those events and um, saying that those things are still there to this day. So the stones were still in the river at the time of the writing of, this, uh, of the book. And Rahab appeared to still be alive in Israel at this time. So if she was a young woman in her 20s, she would have been 50-ish when Joshua died. If she lived for another 20, 30 years, that would put the book have, having been written sometime after the end of the division of the land to sometime maybe 20, 30 years after Joshua's death would be probably the latest. Many think that it was uh, that some was written by Joshua, some was written by Eleazar, and then finished by Eleazar's son, Phineas. Um, some manuscripts, when it talks about crossing the Jordan in the early part of the book, uh, uses the pronoun we crossed over, implying that the person who wrote the book also was you know, there right from the beginning. So I believe Joshua was written by someone who was uh, intimately involved in the whole process um, and quite possibly partly written by Joshua, but probably more likely written by someone who was there for the whole process <clears throat> and completed the book after Joshua's death. So we don't know exactly, but I think we, we have a pretty good idea of the time frame of when, when the book was written. So what's the background of the book itself? Um, Joshua's name means Yahweh saves, and this is a picture of um, God's faithfulness to the Jewish people that he had promised all the way back <clears throat> In the, in the time of Abraham. And, excuse me a second. <clears throat> Some people have a problem with the book because of how it describes Israel's total annihilation of some of the inhabitants of the land and driving them out. And they go, well, how can a God of love, you know, Jesus said we're to love our enemies, how could this be the same God? Um, it's important to know that God never changes. 
how he deals with mankind does change. We're in the dispensation of grace, the church age. But we know that God is still holy. He is still just. And um, he will judge sin. And we know even in this present age, at some point, God's patience will run out and he will remove the church and, and pour down judgment on this earth for its rebellion. We know he did that at the time of the flood, but he saved Noah alive. This is really a story of God cleansing the land from sin. If we look, uh, uh, I don't think we have it on the screen, but Genesis 15, 16, uh, God was uh, reiterating his promise to Abraham, and he was saying, you know, your people are going to go into bondage for 400, or going to go into Israel for 400 years, but after that, you're going to come out, your descendants will come back here, uh, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. In other words, God was being patient with the people of the land. He was giving them 400 years to seek truth and to uh, turn away from their wickedness. Instead, they got more and more evil. And um, God said, all right, enough is enough. I've got to deal with this. Just that God is always working at multiple levels. So on the one hand, he was... Um, keeping his promise to Israel for a promised land. At the same time, he was judging those who were involved in such evilness and wickedness. Leviticus 18, 24 and 25 says that, Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these things the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I will visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants." There's a point at which God says, I will not tolerate this evilness anymore. He goes on to warn Israel, the same thing is going to happen to you if you fall into these same practices. And we'll know as we continue our, our walk through the, the Old Testament here that they failed and God had to judge Israel for some of the same things that he was judging these people for. It's also important to know that the women were just as involved in the evil practices that were going on here. They were commanded to kill man, woman, and child. That is just harsh. How do you deal with that? Um, but the women were just as culpable in their uh, idolatry and, and um, in the practices that were going on, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. The children, uh, we believe that those who, are, who die before they're accountable are protected by God. Uh, we believe today if a child dies before they're able to be accountable for their uh, uh, putting their trust in Christ, that they're under God's protection. So in a sense, this was actually an act of mercy because if they were allowed to grow up in, within Israel, two things would happen. One, um, they would want to return to the ways of their ancestors and they would impact Israel and encourage them to do the same thing. And they would be held accountable for their um, actions at that point, and many would have been lost, but now they're under the protection of God. And it wasn't all the people that were to be destroyed. Uh, some were to be driven out, but the ones that were involved in, in the um, um, extremely evil, wicked practices, God wanted them totally destroyed. Uh, so I'm going to give a little content warning here. Uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the things that went on um, <clears throat> because I think it helps give us a picture of, of how evil and how wicked. We think things are bad in our world today. Uh, this was really, really bad. Uh, so if you have children that are watching this, you might want to turn the volume down for a second or if you're really sensitive to these things, turn the volume down for a minute. I'll give you a thumbs up when I'm done, but we're going to take a brief look at some of the things that were going on in the land. Um, so there were multiple idols, God, false gods that were worshipped throughout these cultures. There were three main ones. All of them involved all kinds of sexually deviant practices. Um, they involved self-mutilation, uh, incest, bestiality, which was... You know, um, sexual activity with animals, adultery, uh, rape, temple uh, sex with prostitutes, orgies, all these sexually deviant behaviors. But probably the worst activity that was going on was that of child sacrifice 
and then the, their worship of their idol Molech, they would build these metal uh, idols that were hollow inside, and there was an opening in the um, stomach area, and their outstretched arms would form a ramp into the into the uh, uh, this opening. They would build a fire inside this the statue until it got um, very hot, and then they would lay their uh, infant child alive on these scalding hot arms and would roll into the idol and be burned alive. And they believed that if they offered their firstborn child this way, that they would um, be blessed for the rest of their life. Um, so you can uh, turn your volume back up if you turned it down. Um, but that is just a, a glimpse of how bad and how evil and how wicked these people were. And so God wanted them wiped out. Uh, it's also important to know that when Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they had a chance to repent. Um, they heard about the things that God was doing for Israel. Um, they could have turned. We know that one person did. We know Rahab did. Uh, but instead, the, uh, the people just hardened their hearts towards God. And God said, all right, time's up. Uh, it was not an ethnic cleansing. Um, otherwise, Rahab wouldn't have been spared. Um, Joshua wouldn't have honored his treaty to the Gibeonites if this was all about a, an ethnic cleansing. Um, we're going to take a look at a verse here in a minute uh, that gives us a little more glimpse into uh, um, the activities that were going on here and God's, God's uh, involvement in it. So who was going into the land? <clears throat> we know from Numbers that <clears throat> the 12 spies went in. Joshua and Caleb uh, gave good reports. So God can help us take this land. The other 10 spies said, no, nah, we, we, we can't. These people are too big. Um, and the people rebelled. God killed the 10 spies that gave the bad report. The people uh, suddenly realized, oh, well, we did a wrong thing. All right, let's go take the land. And, and Moses said, no, you can't take the land. God said, no. Um, but they try anyway, and they're, they're uh, defeated in the process. And so now they're left to wander for, for 40 years. And God had proclaimed that anyone 20 years and older would die in the wilderness of the men of, of war. Um, Notice that in the 12 spies, there was not a spy from the tribe of Levi. Instead, it was uh, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, and the Levites were not included in the first census. They were not considered the men of war that were um, taking possession of the land. So some think that the, there were Levites who would have been older that inherited the land. We know Eleazar did. He was older than 20 years old when the spies were sent in because you had to be at least 30 years old to be doing priestly service. Um, so he would have been um, over 20 at the time of God's proclamation. And we know that he entered the promised land. So some think that the Levites, because they weren't involved in the spying out of the land, they weren't receiving a land inheritance, that there may have actually been uh, older men and women from the, the, uh, the tribe of Levi. But all the rest, the only two that were over 60 years old at this point, would have been Joshua and, and Caleb. So let's take a look at the overview slide. We see in the first five chapters um, is the preparation for the, the conquering of the land. Then in chapters 6 through 12 are the uh, campaigns through the uh, northern and southern and central regions of, of the land. And then we see in chapters 13 through 22 a uh, division of the land. And then the conclusion of the book is Joshua's charge to the people before he passes away. The theme throughout all of this is obedient faith brings abundant blessing. When you follow God, when you do things God's way, God is going to uh, bless. We see Christ um, typified in 
the book of Joshua through Joshua himself, who is a victorious leader, whose name means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. We see Christ's redemption in Rahab. She was to tie the scarlet thread uh, in or cord in her doorway. Anyone or her window, anyone who was inside that household would be saved. Very much like at the Passover, if you had the blood of the lamb over your door, um, then you would all inside would be saved. And it's a picture of Christ's, uh, the protection we have under the blood of Christ. So let's take a look at um, Joshua 1.8. This is one of the key verses of the book of Joshua. We um, see repeatedly the phrase, be strong and courageous, given in, in the book. And then in Joshua 1.8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The key to them realizing God's blessing and um, purpose in their lives was to follow God's uh, ordinances and commandments, to do it God's way, not their own way. Um, they had to start by exercising faith. When they got to the Jordan River, it was at flood stage. Some say, well, they just crossed over the, the Jordan, you know, and it would, in dry season isn't that big. In certain places, they probably just walked across. No, the Bible makes it clear this was flood stage. This was a miraculous crossing. But the Jordan didn't stop flowing until the priests actually stepped into the water. They had to get in the water first, and then God would stop the water and allow them to cross. And that's the way in our own lives, we have to exercise our faith and then we see God work. God expects us to step into the water. We need to um, believe him and trust him that what he says is true and then we need to act and then we see God uh, do his part. Um, in, the, in the middle of the river, um, Joshua set up these memorial stones and then on the uh, other side of the Jordan, each one of the tribes was to carry a stone and they piled them up. And these were to be a remembrance. So when people would pass by and say, what do these stones mean? Well, this, let me tell you, this is what God did for us and tell them the story of, of, of what God did for them. And we're going to touch on memorial stones a little bit uh, more as we go through there. There's an interesting story in um, Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. So let's take a look at those. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So we believe this to be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ to Joshua as leader of the armies of God. Um, the fact that the ground was declared holy, uh, Joshua worshiped, uh, he calls him Lord. Uh, we believe that this is Christ making an appearance and we know that in Revelation, Christ will be leading the hosts of heaven here to earth to, for the final battle against evil. And he was showing Joshua that God is there to fight for God's purposes. The, you know, Joshua asks, are you on my side or are you on their side? And the response is, uh, neither. I'm here commanding the hosts of God. This is really about God versus evil, not Israel versus these other people. And the real question is not whose side am I on, but Joshua, whose side are you on? Uh, Joshua needed to make sure he was in line with God's purposes and God's plan. <clears throat> so there were 
two spies that were sent out into Jericho. They end up in the house of Rahab. This was a divine appointment. She tells them how the people have heard about the Reds when they left Egypt um, 40 some years ago, how the Red Sea had been parted, how they had defeated the kings on the east side of the Jordan and the people were in fear. And she says, I want to follow your God. Your God is the true God. Um, she's referred to as a prostitute. She very well may have been one of the temple prostitutes that we talked about briefly earlier. Um, <clears throat> in Hebrews eleven thirty one. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She believed. And this is a picture of God's redemption that anyone who comes to him in true repentance will be saved. And here she was in the midst of this evil, wicked people doing all these evil, wicked things. And she wanted out. She said, this isn't right. I want to follow the true God the rest of the people had that same opportunity. They could have had the same response as Rahab. Instead, they hardened their hearts to God, and God said, you know, this is enough, and, and the land needs to be cleansed. So the spies come back, and they say, uh, <clears throat> well, this, is, uh, this, is, this is going to be okay. The people are living in terror. They're afraid of us. Uh, they know that God is working for us. We can do this. So a very different report from the, these two spies as opposed to um, the spies from 40 years ago. So they have this great victory. You all know the story of how they, God told them what to do. They did it. Sounded silly. March around every day and then seven times the last day and blow your trumpets. But that's what God said to do. That's what we're going to do. And the walls come down. They had victory. Uh, Rahab was spared, and she even figures into the genealogy of Christ. So, again, that picture of God's redemption for those and protection for those who, who turn to him. Now, you would think that after that, they would um, understand that we, you know, we really need to keep consulting God and following God. But they got carried away with their own... Um, what they thought was their accomplishment at Jericho. And so now they are headed for Ai. God had commanded that everything out of Jericho was to be given to God. No one was to keep any of the spoils for themselves. And we learn later that Achan saw some gold and silver in a garment and he kept them. So now they go up to Ai and a couple of Guys go up, check it out, come back and say, ah, oh, we don't need to trouble the people. We don't need to send the whole army. Let's just send 3,000 men up. That should be plenty to take care of it. They go up and they get whooped. 36 men get killed. They come back and now Joshua's in distress. Here you gave us victory and now what's, what's this? And so Joshua's laying on the ground in the dirt, crying out to God, saying, what are you doing? And we're going to be a reproach to the nations and... And um, paraphrasing here a little bit, but God says, get up out of the dirt. What are you doing with your face in the dirt? Get up, stand up like a man, and I'll tell you what the problem is. There's sin in the camp, and you, you didn't consult me. Um, Achan, or he didn't specify who it was. He said, there's someone who was stolen from Jericho, what I said not to take, and that's why you don't have victory because I'm not fighting for you right now until you get things right. So they have to deal with that. They find out it's Achan. He and his family are put to death. He said, well, that seems kind of harsh. Well, he was responsible for the deaths of 36 men who would have been husbands and fathers, uh, and God wanted the people to know that this was serious. You don't dabble with the sin that's here in this land and um, we see the same in the early church age with Ananias and Sapphira when God took their lives because of their sin. Uh, it was a warning to the church. You know, God is serious about his holiness and, um, and, the, uh, and his people. He wanted to keep them pure. So they take care of that. Now they go up and they take Ai. And now they're allowed to keep the spoils from the land. If Achan had just waited for... 
God's timing, he would have been able to enjoy the spoils of the land like the, uh, uh, the rest of Israel was to do. So again, another illustration of how important it is that, uh, that things were done God's way, not only in this period of history, but in our lives as well. We need to make sure that we're, we're following God's plan and not our own. Um, so you think they would have learned again. I think these are two of Joshua's probably biggest failings uh, was the, f- the failure to consult God before they went to AI, listening to the, the men who said, oh, I'll only send a few you know, thousand up. Uh, and then this next event, the Gibeonites who were nearby uh, were afraid. They figured that they were done for. So they dress up some people in old tattered clothes, worn out shoes, moldy bread, uh, broken wineskins and water bottles, and they come trudging in to Joshua's camp to meet with Joshua. And he said, who are you? So we live a long, long ways away. Uh, we've heard about what's going on here, and we just want you to know we'd like to have a treaty with you. Joshua doesn't find out who they are, doesn't consult God about it, enters into a treaty with them. Then three days later, he finds out they're the next town over and um, they had deceived Joshua. But Joshua had sworn an oath to protect them, to to be in a treaty with them. So he had to honor his treaty. They end up making them uh, slaves eventually, servants, hewers of wood and carriers of water, it says. Um, But... They left them alive because they had made a covenant with them. Well, five kings of the area hear about this and they get together and they say, we're going to go wipe out Gibeon. Um, So the Gibeonites send word to Joshua, hey, you made a treaty with us. We're under attack. You need to come defend us. So now Joshua's in the position of having to defend the people who deceived him. But God says, it's all right because we're going to wipe these five kings out and you will have victory. And this is an, in, another interesting event uh, where Joshua tells the sun to stand still and God hearkens to him and the sun stands still. And for a whole day, uh, the sun stood still while they continued to fight. And then God assists with giant hailstones to wipe out a, a lot of the people they captured the five kings, put them to death, um, and had a, a tremendous victory um, over that region with God's miraculous and divine intervention. <clears throat> but it does give a, a glimpse of Joshua's faith for him to say that and, and, and Joshua's relationship with God, even though he had failed um, to consult God on several occasions. We know that Joshua's heart was holy for God um, and God honored that, listened to him and, and helped Israel be victorious. So the campaigns continue if you, through chapters 13 to 21. Then we get to the division of the land. So th- there, were, there was an initial central campaign and then there were northern and southern campaigns uh, that took care of a good portion of, of the, the problem, the issue there. But then it was up to the tribes when they divided the land to finish the job. Uh, each tribe was now responsible to complete the cleansing of their particular land that they were given. We know that they didn't do that, and it comes back, we see all through uh, judges in the, the following books, just all the problems that resulted because they didn't follow God's command. And they should have known God gave them miraculous victories over their enemies when they followed him. He would do the same for each one of these tribes when they had to finish the job in their land. He would do the same for them if they would follow him. Um, but they... they uh, they didn't do that. Now let's have a quick note on the 12 tribes because this can be confusing because sometimes you see Levi and Joseph, sometimes you don't see Levi or Joseph, but you see Ephraim and Manasseh and uh, what's, what's the story? Are there 13 tribes, 12 tribes, what's what? 
So from a lineage standpoint, the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel, would are the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Joseph, Benjamin, Judah, Dan, Gad, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, and Naphtali. Um, so from a, that, that lineage standpoint, those are the 12 tribes. And in Ezekiel's vision of the restored Jerusalem on the gates of the city are written those 12 names. In Revelation, it talks about the names of the 12 tribes being written on the gates of the new Jerusalem. I believe they will be the names of the 12 sons of Israel. But from a geographical inheritance standpoint, the Levites were not given a portion of land. God was to be their inheritance, and they were to be in cities all around the land, and that's part of the division of the land. These cities were given to the Levites in each one of the tribal areas um, to be priests and mediators uh, for the people throughout the entire land of Israel. And <clears throat> um, Joseph, if you recall, that Jacob had given his, each of his sons an equal blessing. So in a sense, Joseph had received an, a double blessing. Each of his sons was to receive an equal inheritance. So when the land is divided, you see Ephraim and Manasseh, which were the two sons of Joseph, each receiving an equal portion. So um, from a geographical distribution, Joseph is divided into two equal tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So when you see 12 tribes in the context of the land, you won't see Levi or Joseph's name sometimes, but instead you'll see Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, but in the, uh, the lineage, from a lineage standpoint, it would be, um, if you wouldn't see Ephraim and Manasseh, instead you would see Levi and Joseph. Let's take a look at the slide of the, uh, the map of the land then. So <clears throat> you see on the eastern side of the Jordan River, half of Manasseh is on that side along with Gad and Reuben. And then on the west side of the Jordan, uh, the rest of Manasseh and then the other uh, remaining tribes are given portions uh, of land. And again, they were to finish the job of conquering the... Uh, the peoples that still remain, they're either driving them out uh, in some cases, and in other cases they were to uh, just to eradicate them, to get rid of the evil that was in the land. Um, so in this division of land, we come to Caleb. And I think this is, this is um, why, one of the reasons I like the book of Joshua so much it's probably one of my favorite books and is my favorite book, I think, in the Old Testament because of the impact it had on, on my life <clears throat> uh, as a teenager. So let's take a look at Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 and then 10 through 12. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain, of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Caleb could have asked for an easy inheritance. He could have asked for a parcel of land that they had already cleared and said, oh, I'm going to take this. Instead, he says, oh, there's still giants up there on that. And remember, the Anakim were the ones that the, the Israelite, the spies said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Um, there's still cities up there to be taken. And Caleb says, Man, give me that. Uh, God's going to be faithful. I know that we can drive them out. Uh, and he did. Um, Caleb did not see the mountain as an obstacle to be avoided. He saw it as an opportunity to see God work. 
God had promised them the land. God is faithful to his promises. God had promised to be with them and, and help them uh, accomplish this task. And Caleb had the faith to uh, follow up with that, on that. I was a young teenager at Christian Service Brigade Camp in Haycock Mountain in Pennsylvania when the theme that summer was, Now Therefore Give Me This Mountain. And um, through that uh, camp experience, uh, I don't remember who the speaker was, but he was an extremely dynamic person who pointed, uh, pointed us to the obstacles. Here we were, young, young men, teenagers, you know, with our whole life in front of us. You're going to face obstacles in your life. They are opportunities for God to work in your life. Even though maybe we don't like the outcome, it's not always what we might want. Um, but the obstacle, the mountain that's there isn't something to be avoided. It's something to go through with God's help and then we can look back and we can say, wow, look what God did in my life in spite of what the outcome may be. And all of us face obstacles in our lives and uh, challenges. And you know, maybe it's dealing with a, with a terminal illness, a, a death of a loved one, a um, financial crisis, a job crisis. Um, and the outcome may not always be what we would have chosen. But if we take that mountain, that challenge on, with the knowledge that God is with us, God will bring us through. Um, we can then look back, and these become memorial stones in our lives. We talked about the stones that were there so that when people would walk by, they said, what do these stones mean? Well, that's when God did something. And let me tell you about it. This was a memorial stone in my life because it was a point at which I really transitioned from, I had put my faith in Christ as a young boy, but it was a point in my life where this wasn't just my parents' faith now, this was my faith. I wasn't doing this because um, uh, you know, it's what I'm expected to do and it's what my parents expect me to do. Um, and what the church expects me to do. This was my faith. So this was a turning point in my life, and it was centered around the challenges uh, that were given to us at that camp that summer. So that's a memorial stone for me. And so one of the questions is, what memorial stones do you have in your life? We should have those stones along the way as we go through our life where we can say, wow, God really did something here in my life. Uh, and we hang on to those. So when we face a new obstacle, a new mountain, we can look back and say, hey, God was faithful here. God was faithful here. I know God will be faithful here regardless of, of the outcome. Give me the strength to do uh, what it is that, that uh, um, he wants me to do. So that was, uh, again, a, a real turning point in my life. And, uh, and it has encouraged me through the years then to think about those specific times in my life when I know that God intervened and God did something and to hang on to those as, as memorial stones, if you will. So they had divided the land up. They were to go finish the job. And um, Joshua sends the people on their way. And chapter 22 the uh, tribes of Reuben and Gad and the, the partial tribe of Manasseh that were east of the Jordan returned to the other side of the Jordan, and then they built an altar. Well, word got back that, hey, these people have built an altar. Altars are usually used for sacrifice. These people are uh, rebelling against God. They're, you know, only the priests can, can offer sacrifices, and they're, they're, or are they falling into idolatry or, already? You know, they just left. So they set out to do war against their own people. So there was almost a civil war here in the nation of Israel. So they send people to talk to them, like, what's going on here? Well, it turns out they didn't build the altar for sacrifice. They built it as a memorial, as a memorial altar, so that when they're on the other side of the Jordan and 
they can, their children pass by and say, what does this altar mean? It means we are equally involved in the inheritance uh, with your brethren on the other side of the river. We're a part of them. Um, it was to be like a, re a reminder of their, their physical and spiritual connection to the land of Israel on the west side of the Jordan. Uh, it wasn't intended to be for sacrifice at all. So everybody, whew, all right, that's good. Um, but it's a reminder to us that we don't always know what people's motives are. And we can be sometimes quick to judge as to why someone's doing something. It's always a good idea to find out for sure from the person uh, or the individuals because sometimes things may not be what they look like. In this case, they thought they had built this altar to worship on their own and, and were going to bring down judgment from God and all this, and they were ready to, to go to war over it. And it turns out they had a completely different motive for what they did. So just a, a reminder to us to, uh, um, to not be too quick to judge others. So then we get to the final chapters of the book where Joshua gives his final charge to the children of Israel in uh, chapters 23 and 24. And he says, you need to separate yourselves. You need to serve only God. Um, you know, finish the job that God sent you to, to do to clean out the land and, and serve only God. Don't fall into these, the wicked practices of the people that lived here before. Um, so if we take a look at Joshua 24, verses 15 and 16, it says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So Joshua is saying, you need to make a choice. Um, choose who you're going to serve. Me and my family, we're going to serve God. But you need to make that conscious decision. It doesn't just happen. You need to make a decision that you are going to follow God. And they said, oh, we're not going to forsake God. And Joshua comes back and says, uh, you can't serve the Lord. You know, he's holy. And they said, and, and take a look at their response in um, verses 21 and 22 of Joshua 24. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. So in a sense, they're, they're making an oath. Yes, we are going to follow the Lord. Well, we know that it lasted, we know from the end of the book, through the uh, Joshua's, end of Joshua's lifetime, the end of the uh, priests and the elders who were alive at the end of the conquest. It lasted for a time, but it didn't take very long before they started to forsake the Lord, which you'll see in the next books uh, as we continue our study through the, the Old Testament. But again, it gets back to that you need to make a conscious choice to serve the Lord. Um, and the people thought that they could do it. Unfortunately, uh, they were doing it in our own strength. We need to ask God to give us the strength to follow him because we don't have it in ourselves to follow God. We need his help. And that's where we are blessed with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Christ to help us to, to um, bring to remembrance verses that can help us in our walk with, with, through life and um, give us the power and strength we need to, um, uh, to walk for the Lord. So in conclusion, some, some takeaways from the book of Joshua. Uh, it's an illustration of how Joshua is faithful to his word. He had promised hundreds of years before that they, this land was going to be theirs. It also shows that God is uh, long-suffering. He will tolerate sin for a while in the, um, I don't want to use the word hope, um, but in the event that some may turn 
to him. And we know in the case of Rahab, there was one that did. Um, were there others? We don't know, but for the most part, no, there weren't. Um, but God allowed that to go on for hundreds of years until finally he said enough is enough and it's time to remove this sin from the land. So it's while it shows us God's patience, it also shows us God's holiness and justice and the point at which there's a point of no return and God says, you know, that's it. Um, there are no obstacles with God that we cannot overcome. Uh, with God's help, the Israelites were able to accomplish everything he told them to do when they sought him and relied on his help. Uh, we can accomplish any task that he has given us. So we need to ask God to give us victory over the giants in our life, the mountains that are in our life, and trust God to do so. And we need to look back at the times where we know God has done something in our lives and remember those and build for ourselves those memorial stones so when we are faced with a new giant, a new mountain, we can trust him. So I hope that you have uh, found this interesting. Uh, be sure to continue uh, with our ongoing series to the Old Testament. And thank you and have a good day.